I used to love this town until what happened that night. Tomorrow's Thanksgiving, and I'm tired of pretending like everything is normal and it's not. Someone's out for revenge, and they're turning it into a sick holiday game. We're all tagged, and our names are at the table. The longer this goes, the more twisted it gets. The weapon he's using is straight off a Thanksgiving table. Hey guys, what's happening? Niat here with Film Comics Explained. As requested, today we'll be exploring Thanksgiving, the recently released slasher by the maestro of shock, Eli Roth. The year 2007 was graced with a morsel of Eli Roth and Jeff Randall's deliciously twisted minds, a short film that left an indelible mark on the horror genre. This holiday season, prepare to have the stuffing scared out of you. And this year, there will be no leftovers. From director Eli Roth. Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, a spoof trailer helmed by Roth, was a two minute foray into a blood soaked Plymouth, where a pilgrim clad serial killer turned the birthplace of Thanksgiving into a buffet of butchery. With its over the top flair and an arsenal of creative carnage, it teased a holiday where the stuffing is as likely to be visceral as it is bread based. And it did so with a wing so pronounced that it could be felt in the back row of any grindhouse theatre. Fast forward to 2023, Roth and Randall unwrap Thanksgiving, the feature-length evolution of that trailer, and its full bloodied romp through slasher tradition. The film takes a kernel of that faux promo and pops it into a sprawling cornucopia of cinematic excess. It's a homage that not only nods to its own heritage, but also embraces the unabashedly schlocky spirit of films like Scream and Roth's Visceral Hostel series, while joining the illustrious lineage of Trailers Turn Features, a legacy initiated by Robert Rodriguez's Machete and Jason Eisner's Hobo with a Shotgun. He was given an offer he couldn't refuse. I'd cost the most, because I'm the best there is. But they soon realized He's coming after us. They just with the wrong Mexican. Machete. It's cliche by design, a carefully constructed paradox that straddles the line between senseless gore and artful excess, winking at its audience with every blood spattered frame. Featuring a smorgasbord of talented actors, including Patrick Dempsey, Ty Olson, Rick Hoffman, Gina Gershon, Nell Vilak, Gabriel Davenport, and Jalen Thomas Brooks, the film follows a group of teenagers terrorized by a masked figure out for revenge. Set in the historically charged locale of Plymouth, Massachusetts, the narrative unfurls with the chaos of Black Friday, a mad stampede that culminates in calamity. As the year cycles back to a season of gratitude, the town finds itself stalked by a shadow of vengeance. A cryptic executioner embarks on a grim harvest, reaping a spree of death just as the townsfolk prepare to gather in thanks, setting the stage for a thanksgiving that promises more crimson than golden hues. Oh my God. Plenty to be thankful for. <laughs> Opening in the quaint yet foreboding town of Plymouth, the film, thick with the aroma of tradition and impending doom, unfurls a tale of holiday cheer tainted by unforeseen darkness. The town's sheriff, Eric Newland, makes his entrance at the Collins household, where Mitch and his wife Amanda are immersed in festivities with their family. Adding to this domestic tableau is the Wright residence, with the callous Thomas Wright, the Wright Mark Magnet, his new wife Kathleen, and his daughter Jessica, who visibly bristles at her stepmother's presence. The plot thickens as Mitch, the beleaguered manager of a Wright Mart store, is summoned to prepare for the discount frenzy of Black Friday. Meanwhile, Jessica, simmering with teenage angst, plans to escape to the movies with her boyfriend Bobby and their eclectic cohort, the impulsive Evan, social media maven Gabby, the laid-back Scuba, and the sharp-witted Julio. At the same time, as the chill of November descends upon Plymouth, Massachusetts, the frenetic heartbeat of consumerism pulses outside the Wright Mart Superstore, where a coterie of eager shoppers gather, their eyes fixed on the prize of Black Friday deals. Inside this bargain crucible, Jessica, privileged daughter of the owner, orchestrates a pre-sale rendezvous after pressure from her friends. Despite Bobby's apprehension, as they sneak into the store, a dramatic irony unfolds outside. A restless mob, led by Lonnie from a rival school that received a black eye from Evan the week before, begins to seethe with envy and agitation at the sight of the privileged few enjoying their ill-gotten gains. Their furtive entry through a side door is the spark to a powder keg, igniting a stampede that explodes in chaos. 
With only two guards appointed to man the store by the greedy right and one of them bailing out of fear, the glass doors, strained under the pressure of carnal fervor, shatter, unleashing a horde of frenzied shoppers. In this pandemonium, Rothelays bear the human cost of unbridled desire. The lone security guard, Doug, a brief but memorable Chris Sandiford, falls victim to the stampede, his life trampled away under a sea of feet. A shopper also meets a ghastly fate, his neck grotesquely severed by the jagged teeth of broken glass as another customer grabs a toaster from his dying hands. Bobby, attempting to be a beacon of order in the chaos, suffers a cruel twist of fate, his wrist breaking under the weight of an ignorant shopper's foot, echoing the shattering of dreams and order. Amidst this bedlam, the tragedy of Shakespearean proportions continues to unfold. Amanda, arriving with the sheriff to deliver leftover food to her husband Mitch, is brutally struck down. The instrument of her demise, a shopping cart, turned unwittingly into a weapon of fatal consequence. The discovery of his wife's lifeless form, a harrowing scene of grief and despair, marks a poignant moment in Roth's symphony of horror, punctuated by the sheriff's gunshot into the air to clear the crowd. Fast forward a year, and the scars of that night linger, with the shadow of last year's disaster looming large over Reitmart's relentless march of commerce, unfazed by the public outcry and demonstrations. Reitmart, led by the uncaring right and seemingly unscathed by the tragedy, gears up for another sale. Meanwhile, Mitch, haunted by the loss of his wife, has transformed from store manager to vehement crusader against the corporate colossus, along with other survivors of the tragedy. The incident's reverberations extend to Bobby, once a promising pitcher, now a ghost of his former self, estranged from Jessica and their friends. Jessica's life too has turned a new leaf, with her now in the arms of Ryan. However, the past refuses to stay buried, and her relationship with her stepmother, who suggested opening the store again, is fractured as ever. The sudden re-emergence of Bobby marks a pivotal moment, stirring the pot of unresolved emotions and tensions. Bobby, now bearing the scars of the riot, stirs the water of a town already brimming with tension, with Jessica's current flame Ryan none too pleased. The plot unfurls as the teens find themselves ensnared in a web spun by a mysterious figure on social media called John Carver, a name reverberating the historical echoes of Plymouth. His sinister social media post foreshadows a grim feast with Jessica and her friends as the unwitting honorees, and while the image is initially just puzzling, it transforms into the horrific once the meaning behind it is fully realized. Roth skillfully uses John Carver's Instagram taunts to transition from physical horror to psychological thriller, setting the stage for a tale that delves into the spectres of the past and the inescapable consequences of actions, both individual and collective. The macabre and the mundane collide with chilling effect in a sequence that's as harrowing as it's symbolic. As night falls over the diner, Lizzie, a waitress who technically unwittingly murdered Amanda with her shopping trolley in the previous year's Black Friday catastrophe, prepares to close up. Enter the antagonist, a figure shrouded in the visage of John Carver, a mask that serves as a grim nod to Plymouth's historical legacy. The assault is a gruesome dance of terror, a slash across the palm and a head plunged in water, enabling Carver to pin her face to a freezer door. In a desperate bid for survival, she tears her own skin to escape. Unfortunately for her, the killer uses a car in a game of cat and mouse, culminating in a grisly exhibition where Lizzie's bisected body is displayed atop the right mart sign as a ghastly trophy of revenge. Sheriff Newlin, a character who navigates the line between protector and predator, begins his investigation into the murder. With Lizzie's link to the riot unmasked post-mortem, the police posit a vendetta against those entangled in that fateful Black Friday. Here, the director interweaves the narrative with layers of mystery and suspicion, as the teens embark on a speculative journey, pondering the identity of the killer. Could it be Mitch, with his well-known disdain for Reitmart? Bobby, whose career was shattered that night? Or Ryan, seen in a puzzling exchange with the deceased Doug before the chaos erupted? Roth masterfully uses this segment to delve deeper into the psychological underpinnings of his characters, setting a chessboard where each piece moves in a shadowy dance of doubt, fear, and suspicion. The film expertly balances the visceral with the cerebral, inviting the audience to ponder the darker facets of human nature and the consequences of past actions, all while maintaining a gripping narrative of horror and suspense. Thanksgiving is a time for appreciation. It's a time to remember our many blessings, and it's time for all families to be together. Someone went off the deep end. And they're turning it into a sick holiday game. You're not gonna believe what he's wearing.
As Sheriff Newlin, embodying law and order, enlists Jessica's aid in the Carver conundrum, she and Bobby team up to go over archival footage of the chaos from her father's computer. Footage that was conveniently deleted from the store to remove his culpability. Yet Carver's harvest is far from over, as we're then reintroduced to Manny, a convincingly anxious Tim Dillon, the security guard whose earlier flight from the Black Friday pandemonium has left him haunted by more than just guilt. As he prepares for a vacation, an escape from his haunting memories, the ominous sound of an intruder shatters his illusion of safety. Manny's attempt to embody bravado is short-lived as he meets a grisly end at the hands of Carver. His electric mixer becomes an unlikely weapon, and a garrote grotesquely decapitates him in a gruesome display of Ross flair for horror that is both inventive and chilling. The terror escalates as Carver, the spectre of vengeance, moves on Lonnie and his girlfriend Amy, both of whom were embroiled in the riot. In a scene dripping with Ross' trademark blend of horror and dark humor, Amy's trampoline antics turn tragic. Lonnie, oblivious to the looming danger, meets a neck-twisting end, while Amy finds her joy sleeps turning into a dance of death as she's stabbed multiple times from below the trampoline. The film then shifts to the neighboring high school, where Jessica, accompanied by Evan and Gabby, ventures into what becomes a hunting ground for Carver. As the sheriff and his officers loom just outside, oblivious to the impending doom, Jessica finds herself separated from her friends. In a heart-pounding sequence, Carver incapacitates Evan and Gabby, his relentless pursuit of Jessica marked by a chilling close call. Terrified to be next and feeling helpless, Jessica and Scuba meet up with a delinquent McCarty, son of the town's arms dealer, and are surprised by his charity and goodwill, with him arming them with a gun free of charge and wishing them the best. The story continues with a sense of impending doom as Yulia's father, in a desperate bid for safety, decides to relocate them to Florida under the watchful eye of an officer. However, safety proves to be a mere illusion, with Carver breaching the sanctuary of their home before dispatching the cop and Yulia's father in a cold-blooded assault. The terror crescendos when Jessica and Scuba, witnessing Yulia's plight over a video chat, rush to help her, only to find themselves ensnared in a scene of unspeakable horror. Carver, in a display of brutality that is both shocking and grotesque, uses a buzzsaw to claim Yulia's life, leaving Scuba in a state of shock, cradling the lifeless body of his girlfriend. With the remaining survivors receiving photos of Carver's deceased victim sitting around the table, accompanied by Evan and Gabby, gagged and tied to their chairs, it becomes clear that Carver wants a revenge-laden thanksgiving for everyone he thought was responsible for the senseless deaths from the previous year's Black Friday madness. Realizing they would have to look over their shoulder indefinitely until the killer was caught, the Wrights, Scuba, and the local police come up with a plan to lure him out, but sees Jessica, her family, and Scuba placed in the eye of the storm during the parade the following day. Unfortunately, the narrative takes a grisly turn at the Thanksgiving parade, a setting ripe with the irony of a festive celebration turned into a battleground. Instead of wearing the mask, Carver emerges in a clown costume, bringing terror to the parade by decapitating a turkey mascot and unleashing chaos with smoke bombs. Amidst the pandemonium, he succeeds in abducting Scuba in the right while leaving Plymouth in the grip of a terror that knows no end. The film's horror reaches a fever pitch in Carver's basement, where Kathleen finds herself in a nightmarish scenario, being prepared like a turkey. Her fleeting moment of triumph in freeing herself is quickly quashed as Carver recaptures Kathleen and subjects her to a fate that is as harrowing as it is inventive, being cooked alive in an oven. The killer then presents Kathleen's roasted remains to a horrified Thomas, alongside the captive Jessica, Scuba, Evan, and Gabby. In a live-stream spectacle of violence, Carver brutally bludgeons Evan to death. However, Jessica, resourceful and defiant, uses a ring obtained from McCarthy to cut herself free. She passes the ring to Scooper, facilitating his attack on Carver. The film then pivots as Jessica manages to escape, drawing the killer away in a tense game of cat and mouse. Our tenacious protagonist finds herself in a heart-pounding chase through a thicket of woods, with brambles clinging to her as she scales a fence in her escape. With the police searching for his GPS location, but being misdirected by Carver's use of multiple phones, she stumbles upon the parade warehouse. Outside, she discovers Sheriff Newland unconscious, ostensibly a victim, adding another layer of intrigue to the unfolding drama, before spotting Bobby, leading her to suspect him as Carver. But despite their attempt to apprehend him, Bobby slips away into the night. As the police arrive, assuring Jessica her friends and father were okay, in a moment of chilling revelation, she notices brambles on Newland's shoes, mirroring her own path through the woods. This discovery unveils the shocking truth. Newlin is the real John Carver, driven by a dark vendetta, rooted in a secret affair with the pregnant Amanda and the tragic death of their child. 
As he moves to kill her, Jessica reminds Nolan that she forgot to tell him what she was thankful for, and with the sheriff humoring her, she explains she was thankful for the reception in there, revealing that she'd been live streaming the entire event, turning the tables on the killer. With Nolan's facade shattered, he lunges after her in a final bid for vengeance and is knocked down with a hammer to the head, courtesy of Bobby, whose throwing arm is most certainly healed. In a scene that epitomizes the director's flair for the dramatic, Jessica ingeniously inflates a parade float with gas to stage a final confrontation. Their escape, however, is thwarted by Newland's cunning as he attaches the truck's cables to a pillar, sabotaging their vehicle. As Newland approaches, she loads up an old musket with gunpowder and a bracelet before firing a shot into the float, triggering an explosion that seemingly consumes the killer in a fiery blaze. The aftermath is a bittersweet reunion, with Jessica and her friends grappling with the ordeal's emotional toll and the police, shifting through the ashes, conclude that Newland perished in the explosion. Yet Rotha leaves the audience teetering on the edge of uncertainty, as a masked firefighter with an axe, possibly Newland, emerges from the scene. The film then concludes with Jessica in the apparent safety of her bed with Ryan being tormented by nightmares of a flaming Newland, a symbol of the enduring scars left by trauma and loss. No, 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 no! In a cinematic landscape often saturated with restrained terror and polished frights, Eli Roth emerges as the ringmaster of Splatter with a film that revels in R-rated abandon. Known for his unapologetic embrace of the gruesome in cult classics like Hostel and Cabin Fever, Roth fell from the zeitgeist in recent years, but his latest foray sees him tie the knot between gratuitous gore and a winking humor, rekindling the kind of fervor that fills theaters with the resounding crunch of popcorn and burns. A dish first teased in the form of a faux trailer during the cinematic team-up of Rodriguez and Tarantino's Grindhouse has, after 16 years, been plated as a full-course meal. Thanksgiving harkens back to the golden era of 90s slasher flicks, channeling the spirit of Jamie Blank's urban legend and Wes Craven's Scream. It acknowledges that the subversion of horror tropes requires an intimate knowledge of the rulebook, a rulebook that Roth has read cover to cover, dog-eared and annotated in blood, all the while marinating in the brutal essence of early 2000s horror, where I learnt the truth about despair. Growing up, I dreamed of writing a slasher movie that would be like Scream or Halloween, one of these guessing who the killer is, something that's incredibly scary, that's also fun with fantastic kills. When we made the trailer, we had the kills ready, so right. we shot all that stuff, and then we thought, how the hell do we turn this into a real movie? Because I didn't want it to be a joke. The intention was always to make a real film. The killings in Thanksgiving display a particular finesse, eschewing self-referential winks for a more genuine, if brutal, chain of carnage. The film's inventiveness shines through in the execution, literally, with holiday-themed eliminations that showcase a blend of ingenious and barbaric creativity that has you recoiling, leaping, and writhing in your seat. The mundane becomes menacing, and our fragile human form is underscored with each artful demise. It should be noted that the film makes no grand overtures about society's ills, nor moralizes on consumer culture's dark underbelly. Instead, Thanksgiving revels in the irony of a holiday mired in contradiction, indulging in the spectacle without succumbing to sermonizing. Do you like your turkey baked, or do you like it fried? The screenplay, penned by Roth and Jeff Rendell, is an exercise in measured characterization. No individual is so overdrawn as to become a caricature, nor so undercooked as to be forgettable. Each character is a carefully concocted blend of the endearing and the exasperating, their flaws as right for suspicion as they're right for the slaughter. The duo's affection for the subgenre is evident in the jubilant savagery with which they approach their work. It's a veritable banquet of practical effects that would make Tom Savini proud, with bodies that are baked, snapped, and sliced with cartoonish glee. The chase scenes through the corridors of high school hysteria are as protracted and tension-filled as any in prom night, while the characters' decisions are deliciously infuriating, much to the audience's masochistic pleasure. Yet it's not an indictment of our deal-hunting madness. Rather, it's a celebration, a grand toast to the absurdity of our nature. In an era where horror often dons the somber robes of allegory and proselytization, Thanksgiving is a refreshing, head-rolling romp through the slasher heydays, a reminder of the genre's capacity to be gruesomely fun. It's a film that makes no bones about its intentions to dismember the very concept of prestige horror, instead reveling in the sheer, unadulterated joy of the kill. The movie has the guts of Scream, the heart of holiday carnage, and the soul of a filmmaker unshackled from the constraints of blockbuster expectations. 
I wanted to give a new generation their Freddy, their Jason, their Michael Myers, their Chucky. You know, I love those characters dearly. It's why I do what I do, but it's time for some new blood. We've got to give something else like Scream, Halloween, My Bloody Valentine, April Fool's Day, you know, and even like Pieces or The Prowler or Prom Night, Happy Birthday to Me. Mute Witness was a huge influence, Scream. So that was the intention. It's a cinematic feast that delights in its own nightmarish spectacle and exploration of the human psyche. A narrative that delves deep into the themes of guilt, retribution, and the inexorable nature of the past. With that said, that's all for today, folks. A huge thanks to everyone that requested we cover Thanksgiving. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. And if there's anything else you'd like for me to cover, please don't hesitate to ask. As always, it's been a pleasure. Niat here with Film Comics Explained. Thanks for stopping by. Show some enthusiasm. Thanksgiving is an institution here. I don't want to spend my life looking over my shoulder. We need to stop him. No, 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 no! It is going to be a very happy Thanksgiving.